Uh, hello, everybody. This is Glenn McGilvery, Managing Director of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Uh, thanks for joining the session. Uh, it's going to be uh, a little bit of a, of a bummer as we talk about what probably will be Canada's first billion dollar hailstorm event, if not more than that. Um, just looking at some numbers from the past, uh, Canada's costliest hailstorm to date was the August 2014th event in Airdrie, Alberta. That cost our, the insurance industry about $580 million. That's 2018 dollars. Over 51,000 claims were filed as a result of that event. If I look at uh, all the numbers from 2008 to last year, the Canadian insurance and reinsurance industries have paid out over $6.7 billion in hail uh, losses, not including crop hail. Um, we are estimating that this storm is going to cost probably a minimum of a billion. Uh, and we may even approach considerably more than that. It's hard to tell. Uh, I don't want to hang my head on any numbers and it's not an estimate, but I do believe that we're going to be in excess of probably a billion. That's my personal uh, opinion. Um, we have three speakers with us today. We do have one swap out. Uh, Kyle Winston from CRU Underwriters is not able to join us today. Uh, so in his stead, we have Glenn Smith. Uh, but starting off will be Dr. Julian Brimlow from uh, Environment Canada. He's a hail expert and he's done uh, Friday Forum webinars for us in the past. Uh, uh, Julian will be followed by Glenn from CRU. Uh, Glenn is head of CRU's Global Catastrophe Logistics Team and Global Catastrophe Response uh, Unit. And he is currently overseeing the Calgary event. And then uh, ending things off will be Dr. Ian Giamanko from IBHS in the US. Uh, Ian is also a hail expert doing some really fascinating work on hail. And he's also done a webinar for us in the past. So we've got three excellent speakers for you uh, talking about what's going to be uh, not a very happy event. Uh, as noted, uh, we're gonna have the three presentations and we'll handle questions at the very end. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Julian. Thanks, Glenn. I, good day, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us all uh, to speak about this event. It's, uh, like Glenn said, not the best of times to be a uh, Calgarian, especially if you lived in the Northeast. Um, it was quite a remarkable event by any standard. Uh, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge my co-author on this is uh, Sudesh Budu, and he prepared uh, all the radar imagery that you'll be seeing today from our uh, new S-band radar at Strathmore. doesn't seem to be advancing for me. Oh, there, there we go. So I'll just give an overview of where, what I'll be speaking to today. Um, I want to give some background on Canada's Hill Alley. Um, most of you on the call are probably familiar with it, but just in case you aren't, I'm going to review that. I'll also speak about hailstorms in this area and uh, try and get a handle on how rare this event was. And then I'll speak to the impacts of the 2020 storm, which are widespread and devastating. Uh, and then I'll be followed by a discussion of the uh, antecedent atmospheric conditions and the atmospheric profiles in the pre-storm environment. And then I'll give an overview of the reflectivity and Doppler products. And I'll also introduce uh, Canada's particle a classification algorithm called Parker that we now are able to use with the new S-band radars that we have installed. And uh, very fortuitously on this day, there was an overpass by the GPM uh, satellite, uh, not over Calgary, but when the storm was northeast of the city. So we have some coincident data there. And then also on this day, there were other storms farther to the southeast uh, that also produced a lot of hail and even a weak tornado. So I'll briefly look at that as well. And then I'll try and wrap things up at the end. So Hale Alley, this refers to a region between Edmonton and High River, which is south of Calgary, and it's known for its damaging hailstorms. Uh, but the most active region within this belt is between Red Deer and Calgary uh, most years. And uh, this area is characterized by a high incidence of thunderstorms, as you can see in that uh, map at the bottom right there. This is a work that Bob and Bill Burroughs are preparing, or they may even have submitted it. 
And you can see there we're getting upwards of uh, 20 uh, thunderstorm days per year in a 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. So very active for thunderstorms, especially over the foothills. And that's where the storms typically develop and also typically intensify as they move towards the east into deeper moisture. Unfortunately, this area also has a very high population density and it is also, there's very extensive agriculture in the area. So there are a lot of targets for these hailstorms. Uh, the hail season is short but intense. It varies from year to year, of course, when the start and finishes, but typically climatologically it starts around mid-June and continues through late August. And not surprisingly, uh, the area just north of Calgary was the former study area for the Alberta Hill Project. So just tying in once again how this area has a long history of uh, interest in hail. So given that long history, people have had a lot of time to obviously look into um, what precedes hailstorms in this area. And usually it starts off as a nice uh, sunny day and you have lots of incoming solar radiation and heating. And then we have the croplands to the east, so you get this upslope flow in the low levels, which draws moisture up against the foothills. Um, in sync with that, we have an approaching upper air trough with a strong mid and upper level southwesterly to westerly flow. And the result of these factors is you have steep lapse rates, a lot of instability, a good vertical wind shear to help organize the updrafts, and then finally convergence along the orography of the foothills to trigger storms. And the storms typically intensify as they move off the foothills into deeper moisture. So on the bottom right here, we have a photograph showing the change of wind speed and direction with height. And I want you to keep that photograph in mind. This is a, a mean uh, photograph that was calculated when they were still releasing soundings during the Alberta Health Project. And you can see veering of winds in the low levels becoming westerly to southwesterly a lot and increasing a lot with strength. So Calgary has been, is not, I mean, it's far, far too familiar with, with uh, hailstorms. And um, there have been some previous storms. I forgot the air view one at the bottom here, but going back to 1981, I think those were not in current dollars. Those were at the time. Um, then we had a very late hailstorm in September in 1991 that caused a lot of damage. And then back in 2010, again in July, we had uh, an, another expensive hailstorm. So similar to other hail prone areas in North America, such as Denver, Calgary has experienced rapid urban growth in recent decades. Between 1996 and now, uh, the growth rate, annual growth rate in population has varied between about 1.4 and 3.7%. And the population for Red Deer, Airdrie, Calgary, and Okotoks alone, just those urban centers alone within that hill alley is about 1.5 million people. And that's well over half of the uh, people living in urban areas in, in Alberta. And uh, once again, there's been rapid urban, urban growth and uh, marked urban sprawl. On the bottom, you can see the monthly housing starts in Calgary uh, going back to 1948. And you can see there's booms and busts because we have a strong oil and gas sector in the province. So when there's a, when oil's doing well, uh, there's a lot of growth. So there has been a lot of growth in the uh, early 2000s, especially when, when oil was really high. Uh, these, one of the top map here is kind of old. It's from Wurzetau uh, back in 1975, but it shows the number of hail days over the Alberta Hail Project between 57 and 73. Um, as you can see, things ramp up really quickly in May. And then between mid-June and late July, things kind of plateau. And then there's a really rapid decline in hail activity starting in late July. To try and get an idea of uh, the place some context for this storm, how often you have a hailstorm of this nature in the middle of June, I looked at hail reports for hail greater than larger than five centimeters and I broke th the time up into pentads. So that's a five day period. And I looked at all hail events that were greater than five centimeters within 60 kilometers of Calgary. That distance is a little arbitrary uh, but I had to strike a balance between having it large enough that I get some data because five centimeter hail is not that frequent. And uh, so uh, it's a trade off. But if you look at the graph at the bottom there, we can see so these are counts, but per 42 years of record. 
This is, uh, so for example, uh, for the period of June 11th to June 15th in the past, there's only been one event in 1978 when golf ball and larger hail was reported in the Calgary area. The earliest incident I could find or instance of uh, large and golf ball hail is the 31st of May. And then you can see what happens is it's, it's around about three days per pentad and then th the most preferred time is the, the last 10 days of July to have a uh, golf or larger hail in the Calgary area. Um, it's very rare to have hail of that magnitude um, so early in the hail season as we had this year. And then things drop off very rapidly uh, moving into August and September. So I just wanna make some comments on hail damage. Uh, uh, the other speakers will probably address this too, but it's important to remember with that hail, the impact energy that causes the damage scales with the diameter of the power of fall. So there's a disproportionate increase in hail damage for relatively small increases in hail size. And last year, a really nice paper came out in the monthly weather review by some European researchers, and they looked at the damage probability um, for different types of uh, assets, such as uh, roofs on houses, uh, vehicle bodies, vehicle windows, etc. And they found that hail damage increases significantly when the diameter exceeds three to four centimeters. Before that, there is some damage, but not much. Um, and then once you get beyond five centimeters, even more serious impacts to vehicles and houses occur. Uh, vehicle windows started to get shattered, um, house windows get shattered, uh, there's marked damage to roofs. And uh, as you can see, that pretty much inc continues to increase linearly as the hail size starts to increase or continues to increase. The other thing to keep in mind with hail is that the amount of hail is also critical in determining damage potential. Uh, hail is quite dense. It has a density of 900 kilograms per cubic meter. So its weight alone can inflict damage on structures. So consequently, when you're thinking of hail damage, don't only think of the size, but think of it more as a factor of the amount of hail stones, N, and the diameter of the power of four. So when you have a hail storm, the question you ask yourself is, did the storm produce copious amounts of small hail or small amounts of large hail? Or in the worst case scenario, like we had in Calgary, large amounts of large hail. The other thing to keep in mind is that winds are also a major factor because they increase the kinetic energy of impact. So they add to the kinetic energy of the hail falling. And for this, just the back of the envelope calculation here, for a five centimeter hailstone like we had in Calgary, the impact energy falling in a 50 kilometer hour wind gust uh, increases the kinetic energy by 25% compared to if it were to fall in calm air and up to 50% nearly for 70 km hour winds. The reason I gave those two wind speeds is that Calgary International and other locations along the storm path reported gusts of 70 to 75 kilometers an hour. So that would have uh, not only increased uh, the impact energy, but it also would have meant that the angle of the impact of the hail would have changed. So surfaces that were normally protected had the rain, uh, hail been falling vertically were now exposed and at risk of damage. So here's a summary of the 13th, how things uh, rolled out. The storm developed over South Central Calgary, just past about 25 minutes past six local time. And it intensified very rapidly. And in the next 15 to, 15 to 20 minutes, it was a fully fledged severe hailstorm. Um, luckily, um, most of the city and Airdrie to the north were spared the worst of the rain and hail. For some reason that we're still trying to figure out, the storm made a dog leg as it was approaching Airdrie, um, which was very fortuitous. Otherwise, this would have been a truly devastating event. So the northeastern portion of Calgary bore the brunt of the damage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were copious amounts of golf ball hail and larger, coupled with high winds, and this caused devastating damage to homes, vehicles, and other assets. The hail was also accompanied by torrential rain, and that led to widespread urban flooding in the city. So as the storm moved to the northeast, it was a long-lived storm. It didn't stop once it left the boundaries of Calgary. It uh, made a dog leg, as I said, and then tracked northeastwards, and it left a very long hail swath that destroyed young crops uh, that were 
only a few weeks coming out of the ground and flooded fields. Now there was another focus of activity that day and that was farther to the southeast. And uh, just east of Lethbridge, some supercell storms developed that produced very large hail and an EF zero tornado. So a weak tornado, but there's still a tornado. And uh, one of the storms you can see on the bottom right there, uh, which looks more like your stereotypical supercell storm um, that was observed that day. And these storms also caused extensive damage to crops and localized flooding. Uh, someone just posted, uh, Nevin De Lamano just posted something on Twitter showing uh, a hail damage swath uh, east of Lethbridge um, from the storm. So it's visible from space. So the hail on this day in Calgary, there was obviously over a city like this, uh, the, the one nice thing for a scientist is you get lots of ground truth thing. Uh, far too many people holding hail in their hands, unfortunately, but some people are really diligent and measure them hail with calipers, as you can see here. And I'm continuing my crusade to try and get people to please measure hail and weigh it, because weight gives by far the most accurate estimate of the true size of the hail. And uh, that 41 grams there corresponds to about a 4.5 centimeter diameter hailstone, high density hailstone. And then farther to the southeast, there was a very large, sto large stone that fell near in a town called Duchess, which is just north of Brooks. It measured 10 centimeters across and weighed 128 grams. So it was a very large uh, hailstone indeed. So the day started off very nice in Calgary. Um, this is somebody who posts on Twitter looking in different directions every day. They're about five kilometers to the northwest of the city, the downtown core, and they're about 10 kilometers southwest of the airport. So here we're looking to the southeast early on the morning of the 13th. It's a lovely day. By 531, the clouds have started to roll in, they're getting thicker, and you have to think that less than an hour and a half after this, all hell was breaking loose over portions of Calgary. Uh, we do see some convection, but right at this point, nothing too serious. This is now at 6.37 p.m. And you can see off to the right there, uh, what looks to be a hail core, uh, just to the south of downtown Calgary. And this storm was slowly moving northwards, um, which is probably explains why it produced such large amounts of hail at the surface. It was only moving at about 14 knots, whereas the predicted storm velocity from the sounding data would suggest something closer to 24, 25 knots. So it was creeping uh, slowly northwards. But looking at this, uh, you know, Having looked at lots of storms, I don't see anything that's sending off alarm bells apart from that whitish, icy looking sharp depressive to the right there. And at this location, uh, by 6.58, it was torrential rain. I'm not sure if they got any hail at this location. Uh, and about 25 minutes, about 12 kilometers to the east of this location, this is what happened. Um, I mean, it looks like winter. There was uh, large accumulations of large hail. And as you can see, the road was flooding here too. So lots of rain that went with it. So the impacts from the hail, I've seen some uh, impacts from the storm that I haven't seen before uh, from hail. Uh, somebody's Lamborghini got totaled. Something to keep in mind if you're a Calgarian have an, and have a nice sports car. Uh, don't leave it out in the summer. Uh, this Ford truck here, what's new here is, and this wasn't the first vehicle I saw this one, is that the paint is actually being, and you see on the front bumper there, the paint is actually being scoured from the surface of the vehicle. Uh, I had another picture of a vehicle uh, that showed similar scouring of paint, which is new to me. Obviously, lots of windshields were lost, especially the back windshields on vehicles. Um, bodywork, lots of damage to bodywork. And something else I haven't seen before is on the bottom left there, this vehicle, the actual bodywork was damaged. Uh, the, the, the hail actually punctured the, the bodywork on the car. And um, the bottom right here, I could show you dozens of photographs like this of vinyl siding on new houses. So this is an old vinyl that's gone brittle in the sun. This is newly installed vinyl. 
And uh, also, if you look closely at this picture, you'll see the window panes have also been smashed on the left there. So other impacts from the hail, and this one surprised me on the left. This is an auto dealership. And uh, I have to commend them. They're putting up hail nets or shade nets, which I think should be done far more widespread. But on this occasion, there was so much hail and the weight of that hail that caused those uh, hail nets or shade nets to collapse. Now, I'm sure those cars were spared the brunt of the hail damage, and there may have been some damage by the um, structures falling on them, but this would have saved them a lot of money, even though those structures collapsed under the weight of the hail. So that's something maybe one has to keep in mind when you're designing these hail nets is um, try, have a way for the hail not to collect like this. And on the right here, uh, this, is, this was a canola plant that had just emerged not too long ago. And uh, so all those crops that had emerged recently along the swath would have been wiped out. As I mentioned before, there was a lot of rain that accompanied this event. Uh, the rain gauges at Calgary International reported 60 millimeters of rain on this day. About 50 millimeters of that fell in less than an hour as the storm core traversed the city. Now, there, that's the only gauge which I have data from an Environment Canada uh, rain gauge. And I'd also be a little cautious about interpreting these rainfall figures because there was so much hail falling that I'm not sure how reliable those precipitation amounts are. The daily record for June in Calgary is 79 millimeters in a day back in 1932. So this came close, but it, it didn't break the record. And if you look along the storm's track northeast of the city, uh, two sites measured 35 millimeters of rain as the storm continued to move off to the northeast. But there was so much rain and hail in such a short time that it led to widespread urban flooding. So that's going to be a lot of money right there because water is terribly destructive. And you can see cars were stranded on highways as well. And to my knowledge, fortunately, there were no reports of injuries that I'm aware of. Um, not only did crops get hammered by hail, but there was also flooding in the fields. It's been a very wet spring over this part of Alberta, and the ground is quite saturated. So even if farmers did escape uh, the hail, it's very likely that there would have been widespread flooding over their cropland, and that would have also been problematic for them. So I'm just going to give a quick big picture uh, overview. And keep in mind that slide I showed earlier with the shortwave trough approaching from the west over the Rockies. Uh, I'll start higher in the atmosphere at about 300 millibars, which is near the tropicals. And uh, just for reference, uh, there's two red dots here. That one is Calgary, and this is the Lethbridge area here. And you can see this is down, downstream. We've got this strong ridge, and then we have this negative tilted uh, upper air trough um, centered over Vancouver Island and then we have a couple of ripples wrapping around that these little vort maxes here you can see at 500 millibars there's a vort max here of Wyoming approaching and this is at zero Z so about six o'clock local time on the 13th and uh, you can see at 300 millibars typically where we have our jet stream uh, the winds are strong they're about 50 60 knots but the strongest winds were actually at 500 millibars and uh, atypically for this day, for this kind of situation rather, we had uh, south southeasterly winds aloft. And then not really much to speak to at 700 millibars, but again, we have that 700, uh, we have that southerly flow or south southeasterly flow at 700. Going lower down to near the surface, uh, you can see there's a strong northward flow, strong southerly winds pulling warm, moist air into the province as it wraps around the surface low here. And again, this is uh, atypical because normally you want to be on the north side of the low um, where you have your easterly, northeasterly winds and pulling in the moisture. But here they were actually on the south end of the surface or 850 millibar flow. Here's this warm air I was talking about being pulled in or up around the low. And then at 850 millibars, the dew points uh, were greater than 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and the, the surface dew points in Calgary on this day were around about 14 degrees Celsius, which for people out east, and in, I'm sure Ian's laughing at us, but for this part of the world, in uh, this early in the season, 
14 is really high, especially for the Calgary area. And then farther east, we have this low level jet here associated with uh, the, the low pressure system advancing. So the profiles and holographs, uh, obviously in this part of the world, we don't have uh, in situ uh, data. We don't have weather balloon soundings, although I personally opinion we should have one near Calgary um, for events like this. So on the bottom left here, we have the Canadian global model. Uh, so this is a project, this is a forecast sounding. We call them prox soundings. And we also call them proximity soundings. So this is for zero Z or 6 p.m. just east of Calgary. And then this is the uh, North American model uh, out of the States, a mesoscale model. And as you can see, they're largely the same. They've both got this warm nose just above 700 millimeters, a uh, millibar, sorry. And uh, the Canadian model especially has got quite steep lapse rates uh, through the metroposphere. And you can see they're both pretty warm. It wasn't in the low levels and moist, although it was only about 20 degrees Celsius that day in Calgary. So just looking at some parameters to sum this all up, uh, depending which model you're looking at and what time you're looking at, the mixed layer cape was between about 1300 and 2200 joules per kilogram. Uh, there was a lot of vertical wind shear. Uh, the bulk wind difference between the surface and six kilometers was 45 to 50 knots. Uh, the storm relative helicity in the lowest three kilometers was about 110 to 145. The storm relative flow in the lowest three kilometers was from the northeast, so the storms would have been feeding on the northeastern flank. And it was relatively weak though, only around about 20 knots. Uh, the supercell composite parameter, which is a parameter that's designed, it's empirical, but it's meant to identify supercell environments, vary between two and seven, which is indicative of supercell environments. Uh, there's an index called the ship parameter, which was developed by the Storm Prediction Center in the States. Values of this greater than one typically indicate a good likelihood of significant severe hail, so hail greater than five centimeters in diameter. But what you'll notice is the hodograph enclosed by this yellow box here is almost rotated 90 degrees anti-clockwise. This is, I, I haven't seen a hailstorm in this part of the world that's been uh, resulted from that kind of hodograph. Uh, it's very unusual. And, um, but we have these south southeasterly winds, um, you know, with 50 knots, it's really strong winds. And this is something we're going to have to look into because it's kind of new territory for us. Um, it's very unusual. So looking down towards Brooks Duchess to the south, this is about 150 kilometers to the southeast. As you can see, the atmosphere there was uh, drier. Their precipital water was only about 20 millimeters compared to about 25 millimeters over Calgary. Uh, they also have indications of this warm nose. So there's quite a lot of convective inhibition present on this day. But clearly something, maybe that Vort Max coming over the Wyoming border uh, created enough lift to remove that capping lid and storms ensued. But like Calgary, the profile is still very much the same, uh, veering in the low levels, perhaps more so in stronger easterly low level winds, um, creating a somewhat more storm relative helicity up to about 240, but still very strong vertical wind shear. And ML capes uh, were maybe a bit higher and then we have the uh, supercell composite parameter, which is much higher, 5 to 8.5 and a ship of 2. So all these values uh, support the formation of supercells and uh, a large hail. And there's a picture of the weak uh, EF0 tornado that was reported down uh, closer to the Lethbridge area. So just to give an overview of the storm tracks on this day, this is the maximum expected size of hail product, also called the mesh product. That's a radar derived product. And just to give you some bearings here, uh, Calgary is over here and values of mesh here are greater than eight centimeters, um, max out at eight centimeters. Anything larger than eight centimeters appears as white. So you can see the storm over Calgary was moving quite slowly northwards and then it's made its dog leg and it moved off to the northeast and then at this point it split and then we had a left mover which was weaker which one would expect and a right mover which was still producing severe hail. Uh, down here this supercell actually started very close to the US border and tracked northeastwards 
at this about this point another supercell developed so this track here is actually not from one storm it was two supercells in tandem uh moving all the way up towards brooks uh as the evening progressed and brooks is around about here where that extremely large hill was reported so i'm going to go step by step here through uh the reflectivity on the left and the Doppler winds on the right. Uh, keep in mind for Doppler winds, we only see the radar component of the wind. So blues here are winds towards the radar, reds away. So here, for example, in the, we have a northeasterly flow. And this yellow circle here is the area just east of Calgary International Airport. So this is at 24 minutes past six that evening. We had our first echoes appear on the radar of a southern Calgary. Uh, this was in advance of a mushy band of, of rain with some embedded convection that was advancing northwards towards the city. Sorry, wrong way. Okay, this is now at 0036. You can see the cells intensified and I want you to keep your eye out for this weak area of convection to the east of the main storm. And this is at 0042. And you can see this, this cell here is advancing on the main cell, which is intensifying. This is at 0048. So right at this point, the cell is strong, but it's not really looking too nasty uh, on reflectivity. And then the two cells merge. So this cell here is moving in on the eastern flank of the, of the main storm core. Um, it was just after this that that really heavy rain was uh, observed um, to the west of Calgary International. And I'll just add one here. Now you can see after the cells merge, there's a even further intensification. We're getting reflectivities into the 60 dBZ realm now. And you'll also notice here that um, on the Doppler field, there's signs of a weak velocity coupler, but it's not very well defined and it's it's pretty short-lived. It only lasts about 15 minutes, uh, but we do have very strong gradients, reflectivity gradients on the eastern flank of the cell as it moves to the north. And then this is probably when the storm was close to being at its maximum intensity, uh, 24, about 25 minutes past seven in the evening, uh, well into the 60 dBZ reflectivities. Uh, and on Doppler you'll see here we have strong westerly winds uh, at Doppler heights, because this is not at the ground level, it's how the beam increases with height from the radar. You can see we're looking at maybe 90 kilometer hour winds from the west uh, in this area of the storm. And then it continues to move slowly to the north. Note all this time it's been moving slowly northwards. And we still have indication of that velocity couplet here. It's close to about the last time we see it. And then around about this time is when the storm decides it's going to go to the east. This is rapid development on the eastern flank. And I don't know if it was a split or what, but this is when it made its dog leg and spared Airdrie the worst of it. Far eastern Airdrie did get hit. What you'll also notice here, though, is uh, very strong northwesterly winds again uh, associated with this core. Uh, stations in this area reported winds of up to 70 kilometers per hour as well. So if you look across sections, so this is Strathmore on the left, which is east of the city. So this is looking westwards. Here is the cell over Calgary, southern Calgary that's developing. Now there's some interesting things to look at here. First of all, it goes from that to that in 12 minutes. So very rapid intensification. But we also have these other cells over here and keep an eye on those because you'll see they rapidly intensify too and encroach on the main storm and then you get that happening. So it looks like we had some feeder cells and why these are important is, is these feeder cells can provide hailstone embryos, the building blocks for hailstones. So it could be that the huge amounts of hail was probably caused by the low storm motion and also feeding of cells into the updraft core of this main storm from the feeder storm. This is at set, uh, six minutes past seven. And then this is at 24 minutes, about 25 minutes past seven. And you can see here, uh, it's not very well defined, but this is, looks like a weak echo region over here. And a weak echo region means the hydrometeors or the drops are 
going up so fast in the strong updraft that they don't have time to grow very quickly into um, large particles. So it looks like we have a weak, weak echo region here and uh, echo tops from the storm up to about 13 kilometers. And then this huge hail core aloft. We've got 60 dBZ going up to almost 10 kilometers here, which is really impressive for this part of the world. And then that uh, hail core collapses to the surface in the next 12 minutes. And then it looks like the storm's over. It looks like it's weakening. But again, notice here, we have new development on the, on the eastern flank of the main core. And that then results in a resurgence. And then here we have another one on the eastern flank with the main core off to the west. And then we have these two cores with another one developing. So you can see this renewed development on the eastern flank and feeding into the main core. And at times it looks like the cell actually had multiple updraft cores. Um, and I'll speak to that a bit later. So just to introduce Parker, uh, this is gonna be a huge boon for us in Canada to be a finally um, have a hydromedia classification algorithm with our new radar. Uh, the black circle here is just east of the airport as before. And at the bottom here, we have the mesh product, which gives us an indication of the maximum expected size of hail. Um, so there is pretty bro good broad agreement between this mesh products on the bottom and the uh, hail hydrometer classification algorithm on the top. Now, the, the one disadvantage of the classification algorithm is that it tells you whether or not there is hail. It doesn't tell you how big the hail is. So researchers found that the best means of identifying hail is to combine um, dual polarization radar with uh, single polarization metrics such as the mesh. So th these obviously show uh, hail over the exact area where severe hail was occurring over Calgary. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, very fortuitously on this day, we had a GPM satellite overpass uh, at about 20 minutes past nine that evening. By this time, the storm was still trucking off to the uh, northeast of Kiers Calgary and it tracked off to the northeast. Uh, the satellite is passing from southwest to northeast. The satellite's got two radars on board, a KU band and a KA band. Uh, KU band is better for detecting heavier precip. KA band is a shorter wavelength and is strongly attenuated by a uh, strong precip. Uh, Randy Chase provided me with these data that night. Um, it's amazing how quickly people can pull stuff off the internet. And this is a cross section from the uh, Strathmore radar along that track, along this yellow line, which is similar to the one from the satellite. And there Correspondence is quite remarkable, how, how well they correspond. Um, obviously, the detail and intensity of the reflectivities is much better for the S-band radar than for the space-borne radar. Um, this dark red along here is the surface. And you can see, the remember, the signal from the satellites going from the top down. And there was so much ice in the storm and hail that the KA band was completely attenuated by the time it got to the surface. It couldn't even pick up the surface. And uh, Randy tells me that this core, they flagged the data, and these data were flagged with a, uh, an ice flag that says there's a high amount of ice in the storm, which uh, one would expect. And that flag has been uh, linked in the past to uh, hail at the surface. So we're really lucky, and I think this, these combining these data is going to help us understand more about what happened that day. So this is just an animation of the Brooks Duchess storm. Um, Calgary is off to the west here of the radar, and then Brooks is over here with that blue triangle, and then uh, Duchess where the large hail fell is over here, and Lethbridge is down here. So you can see uh, these two storms basically tracking in tandem, and at one point they merge southwest of Brooks, and then it becomes a little messy. Um, but there was a strong uh, velocity couplet. If you zoom in, uh, this is around about, we think the hail fell in Duchess. Uh, we have a velocity couplet here um, in the Doppler fields. And there's also a little pendant possibly visible here. So we're gonna have to try and untangle. It's a little difficult because we have two really strong cells in the area at the same time. Um, 
Duchess is about where I've got my cursor now. So you can see there's two cells and we'll have to look to see which updraft core uh, with these mesocyclones in supercells, they can actually fling the hail quite far away from the actual precip core, maybe as much as 10 kilometers. So we'll have to look into that. So just to summarize things here, I'm way over time. Uh, the storm developed over South Central, Central Calgary just after 6 p.m. on that day, and it really rapidly intensified in the next 15, 20 minutes into a full-blown hailstorm. Uh, northeast portion of Calgary was really hard hit by the hailstorm. Um, as I mentioned earlier, those copious amounts of golf ball hail and larger, uh, up to six centimeters maybe, coupled with strong winds, caused, and that caused devastating damage to homes, vehicles, and other assets in the city. Uh, it was accompanied by torrential rain, almost two inches in an hour, around about 50 millimeters, that led to widespread urban flooding. Uh, farther to the southeast, two long-lived supercell storms produced giant hail, and one of them produced an EFO tornado, zero tornado. Uh, this is still very early days in the process of understanding why the storm developed over Calgary and why it produced so much hail. Um, obviously, this is only two weeks after the, the, the event, and we're still trying to figure out what was going on. Initial indications are though that it's really rare to have such a severe hailstorm this early in the season in the Calgary area. It's only occurred twice before that we're aware of and I'm pretty sure those two events were nothing like what we had uh, two weeks ago. So some aspects of the antecedent conditions are at odds with the conceptual model for severe storms in this area. The obvious thing that comes to mind is the hodograph that's rotated 90 degrees to the left. So based on what I've seen so far, I'm inclined to classify this as what we call a hybrid multi-cell supercell storm. This is a term that uh, Nelson and Knight came up with in uh, 1982. And uh, it, storms follow a, spe a spectrum. You can't really easily pigeonhole them. But these hybrid multi-cell supercell storms are known to be prolific hail producers because they contain multiple updraft cores. And that's what we were seeing in a lot of those vertical cross sections that I was showing you. And also the scale and nature of the hail damage raises questions about building codes for houses in hail prone areas and how we mitigate that risk. But I'm not an expert in this field, so I'm going to let Ian and others speak to that. Um, but I think it's something that we seriously have to uh, consider moving forward. So just a thanks to a few people who provided data and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Julian. That was, uh, that was excellent uh, and a great start off presentation to help us understand what happened that evening. Um, I know what I said earlier that we were going to save questions for the end, but I think it might be a good idea to, to knock off a couple of the questions as the Q&A box is getting pretty full and it will be difficult to go through everything later on. So I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions, Julian, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, somebody asked, uh, uh, can they know the data source for the maximum mesh? Where does that data come from? Uh, those data are produced in-house at Environment Climate Change Canada. Uh, as far as I know, uh, they're not shared outside um, with anybody. So we do share the reflectivity data with outside partners, but this is a, an in-house product. Okay. Uh, the same person asked that, uh, you mentioned it was a wet spring this year. Have you explored this year's weather for major hail events against other years of weather that had lesser hail events? I'm not sure about that, but... Um, yeah. Um, uh, to be honest, no, it, it's, it's kind of early, but obviously that is something we will look at. What I do know from experience, and this is completely anecdotal, is that typically years when the hail season starts early, though following the remainder of the hail season tends to be quite active, but that's anecdotal. But we will definitely be looking at how this year, in terms of the overall synoptic scale school circulation and such, compares with uh, years with lots of activity and years with very little activity. We have a question here that I can partly answer, and I'm not sure, Julian, if you'll have uh, uh, something to say about it, but somebody asked, should we expect more of these kind of events in the future compared to what was seen in the past? Uh, now, 
early last year, I guess it was, can, uh, ICLR uh, produced or published uh, its latest climate, uh, hail climatology for Canada. Uh, and in that document, uh, which is freely available on our website, we have found a statistically significant increase in the amount of hail in Alberta over the previous uh, 20 year period. So we can probably expect more hail in Alberta. Um, I'm not sure about more large hail, but uh, Julian, do you have anything to add to that? Right. Um, yeah, uh, I can't remember when it was now. As uh, maybe two years ago, we published a paper in uh, Nature Climate Change, in which we used uh, climate model output to drive uh, the hail cost model, and those data indicate that moving forward over Hail Alley, um, one could expect uh, increased likelihood of uh, severe hail events moving into the future. But that was for the 2040 to 2070 uh, time frame. Um, but it sounds like we may already be seeing uh, an increase. And that's probably because of the warming. Uh, warmer air can hold more moisture and that's fuel for thunderstorms. Uh, warm air also acts to destabilize the atmosphere. So yes, and then the modeling data does suggest that we could expect more large hail moving forward. The other thing is even though it's warmer, counterintuitively one would think, well, then the ice is going to melt. But keep in mind that some of these large stones are falling at about 30, 40 meters per second. So the time they actually spend below the melting layer is very short. Um, the, the biggest uh, loss of hail is going to be at the small end where, where there will be more uh, melting as, as the atmosphere warms. Um, thank you. And we have uh, an inevitable question about cloud seeding. Uh, does it work? Um, what are your thoughts on whether or not cloud seeding reduces hailstones by producing many small stones versus the thought that it causes existing hail to fall more or more rain right. to fall? So what are your thoughts um, on seeding? That's a very tricky one. Uh, and the, the main problem we run into with trying to ascertain whether or not the cloud seeding is working is that the atmosphere is a terrible lab in that it doesn't replicate itself and one can't really do control experiments like one could do, say, for a drug if you're in the medical field. So that does, depends where you look and it depends what data you look at, um, but the, the results tend to be mixed. So I, I think it's hard to say unequivocally that it works, but the answer to that will vary greatly on the person you speak to and their experience uh, with the data. Um, from my perspective, uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, w without having a controlled experiment in, in the real world, it, it's really hard to say definitively whether or not it works. Right. Um... Uh, I had numerous questions about whether the storm was seeded that day. It's my understanding that it was, but I have no other details uh, to offer there. Um, we have a question about whether there are other regions in Canada that are considered hail prone. And uh, if you look at our ha ha hail climatology of Canada, that, that document uh, does contain maps uh, and it does contain the general hail map of Canada. Uh, Southern British Columbia is very susceptible to hail. Uh, all through the southern prairies are uh, fairly susceptible and right on down in southern Ontario through southern Quebec and a little bit in the east but not much but uh, I don't know if you have anything to add to that Julian about uh, no that's what I would have said <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna move on very shortly um, somebody asked a question of the impact of the storm on livestock I, I don't have any information on on that um, Hail tends not to kill uh, individuals uh, or livestock. This could have been different, but I haven't heard anything about that. Um, somebody made the comment that um, that the GOES weather imagery showed earlier that day that uh, a big storm was was brewing. Um, do you have any comment about GOES and and you know whether it may have indicated a big storm was coming and uh, whether it's well, anything, any comments there at all, Julie? Uh, the, I think they're referring to the GOES satellite imagery. That's right. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we, we had the ingredients um, for severe thunderstorms that day, for sure. Uh, I, I, whether or not somebody would have told you that morning what was going to happen at 7 o'clock in Calgary, in the northeastern part of the city, 
um, we're not there yet. And even with our high resolution modeling, uh, we're not at the point yet where we can pinpoint storms that, you know, far ahead of time to within an accuracy of a few kilometers. Um, the, the really tricky question that day was, okay, there was a lot of cover earlier in the cloud cover and that can be, makes things really difficult for, for thunderstorm forecasting. Um, the big question was not, you know, it was where the storms are gonna go and when. And satellite can give you very useful information for now casting, you know, for an hour or two out, but not really beyond that. Right. Uh, final question that will help me clear out the Q&A box. Um, is there a resource to be able to understand these graphs? Uh, so you showed some pr pretty uh, sophisticated side uh, scanning and things of that nature. Is there anything out there that can help a lay person understand these uh, a little bit? Uh, yes. Sorry, I apologize for that. Um, well, there are lots of resources, especially for the, um, if you're looking at the sounding data, there's lots of resources online uh, to help you interpret the skew T plots. They call skew T plots in the hodographs. Uh, radar data, I would imagine it's the same as well. The, the Doppler fields are always very tricky to, to interpret. Um, but I could add some to my uh, final slide here if, if people would uh, like that. Uh, before I submit it to Glenn. Yeah, that's, that's good, Ian. Thanks. Okay, very good. Yeah, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, kind of the damage aspect, but mostly the kind of the building products and, and what has kind of led us to the point uh, where we are with regard to hail storms. And, and I'll reference some of the work we've done at IBHS here in, in the U.S. Uh, and some of the data that kind of goes with it. But unfortunately, um, what damaging hailstorms continue to do both in the US and Canada is really expose our vulnerability to this peril. I used to joke um, that it was the, the Rodney danger field of hazards from weather that it just doesn't get any respect. Um, and, and I've gotten more serious and that Julian knows me that, that we have got to start paying attention to this particular hazard and figure out what we can do uh, to start attacking the, the damage that hailstorms cause um, every year. Um, we simply just don't build uh, with this particular hazard in mind. And the, the questions come to mind is, is it because we don't consider hail a life safety threat? As engineers, we think about looking at um, life safety protections, making sure we build our structures to not come apart from a, a life safety perspective. But we've done lots of things, uh, at least in the, you know, in the U.S. in terms of, of making things more efficient. Think energy, energy star, and, and trying to uh, reduce... Um, the total amount of energy needs, I and mean, that's codified. A lot of those components are codified. Um, how do we start building and get this hazard uh, much more upfront uh, in terms of the damage? It, you can look at the stats that any given year, you're dealing with 60 to 80% of the, the uh, severe local storm or severe convective storm damage is simply from hail. It's not tornadoes, it's not derechos. Uh, it's simply replacing roofs from hailstorms. And, and the event we're looking at today, the Calgary event, is at the, the far end of the damaging spectrum out potentially in the, the, the billion dollar level. Uh, so a little bit on the spectrum of, of hail damage. This is a, a slide, a box and whisker plot from uh, hail pad data in the United States from 1999 to 2018. It's about 33,000 cases. But the citizen scientists who used this uh, and submitted their hail pads actually had the opportunity to provide a, uh, a visible estimate of damage around their home. Um, and I categorized it in kind of a severity scale just to look at some of the things that Julian actually touched on at the beginning of his part. Um, as we look at kind of moving up the severity scale with hail size, and I apologize, I am an American, so it's in inches, not centimeters. Uh, as a good scientist, I should have uh, hopped over to the metric side, but um, as Julian mentioned, you know, looking out at the far end, severity or scale number four, which is damage to vegetation, shingles, car windows, and house window damage, and that's what we're talking about with this event. You're looking at a kind of an average hail size just under two inches or in that, you know, five centimeter ballpark. But the box and whisker plot itself has some spread to it. Um, the one thing that we were also able to look at from this data set is impact angle. Julian mentioned this as well. And what actually was found from some of the hail pad data, the, the impact angle actually becomes less vertical as hail size gets bigger. Um, meaning the super soft thunderstorms that we're talking about, the ones capable of sustaining large hailstones, also produce strong outflow winds. And that's a very damaging 
uh, concept of once we get out toward the end of the spectrum of storms, these really high-end damaging events. Um, so it, it's interesting to note that those, those, those thunderstorms that produce big hail also produce strong winds. They are supercells, these big rotating thunderstorms. They are the most kind of intense form of land-based convection or, or thunderstorm activity that we see. So what, what are the ingredients? Um, well, the big hail one is a no-brainer. Uh, you need big hail. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, damage in terms of the building uh, envelope and structure starts to occur somewhere in that, you know, three and a half uh, centimeter range. That's about an inch and a half, um, you know, three to four centimeters. That's when we really start to see damage uptick in terms of the building uh, materials. Uh, major metropolitan area, uh, that's another one that's, that's pretty much given and a huge problem here in the United States with essentially the kind of the suburban sprawl uh, that we see. Uh, our suburban environment is just growing very quickly outward. Uh, but another component of that is we build larger, uh, larger homes and they're much more close together. A uh, good example in the U.S., um, we went from average square foot, um, square footage of a single family home here in the U.S. back in the 80s of about 1,700 square feet. And we topped out at a max of over 2,500 square feet in 2015. That's a lot more building materials when one of these events hits our major metro centers and our suburban sprawl environment. Uh, that's a lot of building materials that actually have to get replaced when it's damaged. So the cost just goes up and up and up and up. Uh, this particular event had the bottom left piece of the puzzle, which is lots of hail and wind. Uh, high, con high concentrations of hail uh, that are buried in those strong outflow winds can even turn small hail. You, you can drop that, that hail threshold down uh, as you're accelerating these smaller hailstones into that energy rain. And as Julian mentioned, you just start, it, it's, it's an exponential in terms of the amount of energy a hailstone can impart on a material as it essentially moves faster. So uh, that's a problem there. And then the big piece uh, of the puzzle on the bottom right that, that we tackle at IBHS, vulnerable roof covers. Uh, the United States and Canada are the only two major developed countries that essentially the dominant roof covers asphalt shingles. Asphalt shingles are extremely vulnerable to hail. And the problem is most of the materials, including our roof covers, are not primarily designed to resist large hail. I mentioned before, we don't necessarily design with this particular hazard in mind. So uh, Julian touched on the, the suburban sprawl kind of scenario. This is Calgary in, in 2002. I love a good Google Earth image. Uh, we could take a look in 2019. Obviously, we're going from winter to summer here with the, the greening up of, of the imagery there. But you can kind of get a feel. I'll toggle back again uh, on the left side of the image, the growth that's actually occurred. So again, we're spreading out. Our targets uh, for these storms to hit are simply getting bigger and bigger. Now, what gets damaged in a hail event? Uh, we did a close claim study of a Dallas-Fort Worth event uh, where multiple supercells moved over the Dallas-Fort Worth metro in Texas. Uh, and 90% of the damage occurred, 92% uh, occurred to the roof, uh, essentially roof claims. And then we had about 2% of that was windows, 1% wall, 5% were other building components and, and surrounding uh, components and cladding type features, except for the wall cover. Uh, so again, roof. Roof is the dominant driver. Now, in our Calgary event, we saw substantial wind-driven hail, so we're also adding not only the roof damage that comes with hail, but also probably higher percentage of wall damage. Uh, in this DFW event, it, it wasn't explicitly clear if there was a whole lot of wind-driven hail. We did have multiple supercells that actually got included in this particular study, but a lot of the dollars simply go to roof replacements. And, and what's actually causing that? I think a lot of you may uh, know the answer to this already. 79% of the claims had to do with asphalt composition shingles, both three tab and architectural. Uh, the other roof covers, again, the market shares are pretty small, so you wouldn't expect big pieces of the pie. Uh, and then we also had about 18% in the claims data where we didn't actually know uh, what roof cover it was. Uh, so from an insurance perspective, it's extremely important to actually know uh, what's getting put on a roof. Um, but there's the percentage breakdown from this particular uh, case study that was published. Uh, my wife, Tanya Brown, uh, Jamanco published this work with us in, in 2015. We did that analysis. So there's a paper out there in the Journal of Weather, Climate, and Society uh, from the American Meteor Meteorological Society, if anyone wants to go uh, take a look at it, that has a lot of the details about this particular uh, claims analysis study. 
you know, the, the bigger question though is, is product performance. Can, can we get building materials uh, that actually can resist hail to, to some extent? Now, we're not talking necessarily about trying to protect from say a, a four inch, you know, you're looking to, you know, 10 plus centimeter hailstone that can puncture a roof deck. But we gotta start whittling away at the, uh, the, the lower end of the spectrum where we're dealing with lots and lots of roof replacements. Uh, you may have heard of impact resistant shingles and I'll talk a little bit in a second about how these are tested and what that means. Um, but when we're looking at products, do we really understand their performance and where there are testing standards, do they actually give us some idea of, of their real world uh, predictive value? Can it actually tell us how these products are gonna perform in a, a real hail event? Uh, well, most of the time as we're dealing with, with um, asphalt shingles, so think about US and Canada roof cover, there are impact rated products. Um, they don't have a huge market share. Uh, it's kind of localized where they, uh, where they see upticks in their, their overall market share relative to unimpact rated products. Uh, and the way they're tested is through um, Underwriters Laboratories uh, UL2218 program, which is essentially a steel ball drop on the shingle. It's a pass or fail. There's multiple classes, one through four. Uh, and they test new products essentially right off the factory floor. Well, a, a couple things come to mind is, is the problematics with, with pass fail. You have no kind of distinguishing scale to understand true performance uh, and, and the way they do that. And then the next piece is the steel ball bearing. Well, okay, you can drop a, a big hunk of steel at about the same kinetic energy as a hailstone, but the impact energetics and the distribution of that impact energy is, is not even close to how hailstones function. Hailstones essentially kind of liquefy. They can also bounce off or shatter, and that impact energy is actually dispersed over a smaller area. The hailstone's put under compression as it actually impacts the shingle. Um, but I'll leave you with, as I kind of advance the slide here, to think about is, well, if you have a test that's not representative of the, the real world, and you have manufacturers designing their products to pass the test, think about that as a problematic piece of the standardized testing puzzle. Uh, so I'm going to show a video. I hope this shows up on Zoom pretty well. I've had some success with Zoom and videos. This is what that UL2218 test looks like. There's the steel ball. Uh, this would be the class four impact test. You drop it twice on the same spot on a shingle panel. Then you actually cut the shingle out and look at the damage on the back. So here's kind of an up close look. You have certain uh, areas you would hit, but notice on the, the shingle itself in some of those close up images, and there's, there's uh, myself sitting in the back about maybe 20 pounds lighter <laughs> back then uh, when we were running through our UL test. But you actually flip the shingle over and bend it over a, uh, a radius and look for a crack. Um, and that's the, essentially the pass fail. Well, what we actually found through running through a whole bunch of different products that we purchased essentially off the supply chain is no product actually passed the UL test, despite the fact that they were rated class four. Uh, we actually took all the impacts we did with those and looked at passing percentages uh, this is looking at three tab asphalt shingles versus impact resistant three tab shingles. And you do see an uptick that the IR products as a whole do perform better. But notice these are, these are uh, all the way at the class four, these are class four labeled shingles uh, that didn't pass the test, even though they had that rating. So, okay, there's a, there's a question. Uh, is a supply chain issue? Is it just because they're, they're absolutely brand new? Um, we don't really know. Um, if we flip over to architectural, uh, we kind of see the same story. Uh, the yellow bars are the class four impacts. These, the IR shingles listed are supposedly should meet the class four um, rating. Uh, and we see a 41% passing rate where theoretically you would expect that to be at 100%. Uh, and we don't see that. Um, you do see the relativities as you step through the classes. But again, in the testing itself, it's a pass fail. It's either you know, passes or a fail. Uh, and it doesn't matter how severe the damage is. It's just, is it there? Is there a crack on the back? You get a pass or a fail. If there's no crack, you pass. Uh, and we do see the relativities where you shift from the basic architectural up to impact rated uh, does give you some increase in performance. The problem was is, is the test itself. Uh, and there are some other ice tests. The, the FM has a, a nice ball test that uses essentially an ice ball that's made in your freezer. 
um, not necessarily representative of the structure and the way hail actually impacts a roof, whether it bounces off, shatters, or turns to kind of slush. It doesn't account for hail strength or density. Uh, but the problem with a lot of these is uh, in much of our building standard environment is they trace their roots back to old science. Most of it is obsolete. Uh, in the hail realm, and there's some great stories, a paper that Andy Heinsfeld and Robert Wright wrote, uh, talked about how some of the original hail diameter to kinetic energy work came about in the 1930s. And there's even a story about stealing data uh, and all these kinds of things. So it, it, the problem is that the standards never kept up with the science. But if you think about it, it's not really a flashy aspect of a science. It's the academic community is not going to really touch it as much. Um, so that's where IBHS actually came in, was, was can we actually work and, and understand these things to try to up, um, up the product performance and get new testing uh, that's representative of the hazard. In this case, we're talking hail. Um, so our kind of roadmap, and I'm going to get to something where we actually show how we've changed the marketplace, and, and it does give me some optimism that, that we can do better. Uh, I mentioned we evaluated the existing, the existing test standards, and, and I talked about UL. Uh, we actually have an ongoing field program that, that's been going on since 2012 where we actually measure the material properties of hail. Julia mentioned it's so important to get not only the, the dimensions, but also the weight. Uh, the mass is so very important in understanding a lot of these relationships. We actually also did compressive strength testing, meaning we crushed hailstones to, to see how much force they could take. As they hit your roof, they actually undergo a compression. So it's a very good way to analyze how strong hail can be. And yes, it can be slushy, it can be very weak, and it can be very strong. I think the strongest hailstone in our database took about, it was like 400 pounds or so of force to fracture. If you put that in a pressure, uh, it was like 6,000 pounds per square inch. And, and I think my car tires have like 41 or something is, is the, the rating on that. So hail can be very, very strong. Um, then we had to figure out how do we manufacture that in the lab to develop a repeatable test program. Uh, and we did that, and I won't get into the details of that. There's a, a really behemoth thing. If you ever get to come down to the IBHS uh, research lab, I'll be happy to show it to you once we're out of uh, uh, COVID land uh, these days, and we can all actually be in the same place with each other. Um, we had to do that R&D to match those properties that we saw in the field, and then ultimately figure out what a new test program uh, worked with. And we did an objective kind of machine vision based damage assessment uh, that gave us these type of ratings. And these are publicly available now on uh, IBHS.org looking at shingle manufacturers. These are impact rated products. So these are all class fours from the UL program. Uh, and you can see we can actually distinguish between product performance. And what you're looking at is the scorecard from June of 2019, our very first rating system to the latest one, which was October of 2019, and we'll be having a, a new version come out very, very soon. Uh, but notice we lost a, uh, we've introduced a couple new products and we've lost that poor performer at the bottom. Uh, that particular company actually removed that product from the marketplace as a result of these scores. Uh, now the IBHS Fortified program, which is our enhanced building standard uh, that takes you above code, actually requires you to use a good or excellent performing uh, shingle in our test um, to be able to qualify for that designation. So anywhere on the overall rating, if you see a green dot, that would qualify for the, um, the fortified program. So we have shown, and this is using a two inch laboratory manufactured hailstone, best scientific re representation we can really do in a lab setting for, for hail. Uh, so manufacturers can change. They were just designing to pass an old test that really wasn't representative of the hazard itself. Um, so we've seen some movement, even just over the span of, of the months that we've had this going, uh, a manufacturer is really uh, working very, very hard to try to get better products in the marketplace. Now, there's the consumer awareness aspect that we have to get going. Um, people often ask about costs. So we took all those good and best performers uh, and did a cost survey. And we're looking at data from the Oklahoma City market. This is pure material cost per 100 foot by 100 foot roofing square. Uh, so the, your average non-impact rated basic shingle is about 93 bucks um, US dollars per square. Most of the good and excellent performers are maybe about 20 bucks more to a little bit less. Uh, and there's a couple that actually come in below the average non-impact rated product. So you're, you're talking about a increase in cost, but not cost prohibitive. If we can get some awareness about trying to stop 
the annoyance of roof replacements that come from uh, hailstorms every single year. So this is not a, a total cost prohibitive uh, material that can do better. Um, so, so how do we kind of reduce the, the roof damage? We got to get better performing shingles. We started to see the market change and we need to understand also how that changes with age. Uh, asphalt shingles can become brittle uh, with age and we need to understand that performance. All of our good and ex excellent performers in our test were polymer modified asphalt products, meaning they had a polymer additive into the shingle material that helps essentially make them a little more flexible and able to withstand the impact energies of hailstones. Uh, there's also alternative roof covers. We look at composites, technologies, um, all these emerging things that are starting to come on the market. Can they be cost effective um, and, and actually help bend down this uh, damage? So here's what the video of our test program actually looks like. That's a hard impact. So a hailstone that was designed and manufactured to bounce off with, with a high level of strength. Uh, there's some of the, the damage uh, that you would see in our, our testing. Uh, and we actually take all the impacts on a panel and, and uh, essentially statistically weight them. Uh, in various damage scores. So I would encourage folks to check out IBHS.org and some of the things we do uh, to get a little inside look at our, our testing program itself. Um, some of the composites, this is a, a composite shingle uh, called the F-Wave. You can see the hailstone just bounces off of this. These products, a few of them do ask, offer a true hail warranty. Um, they often will see small dents, but they can repair themselves. Uh, from a pricing standpoint, though, they're often somewhere between two and four times the price of an impact rated shingle, asphalt shingle. Uh, but there's a look at how some of these products uh, acted during our, our particular testing at the lab of them. Uh, but as these materials costs come down, uh, they could become more and more options uh, for resilient building material. Uh, other aspects, we saw lots of siding damage. Vinyl siding can get very, very brittle. This is a great example that Julian sent me that was from Twitter uh, shortly after the, the Calgary storm. Um, you've got a, almost a one-to-one -one comparison here. You've got a shake siding on one part of this building, whether it's concrete fiberboard or wood composite. Kind of looks like wood because there's some spatter marks on there. Right next to vinyl siding that was just absolutely shredded by this wind-driven hail. And you can even see some window damage there. But a one-to-one -one product comparison. Uh, our vinyl siding product in this instance got so brittle it just couldn't handle these impacts and essentially will have to be completely replaced. That's a lot of cost right there in one particular image with a side-by-side -side product comparison. So if we think about how do we build, we got to get these materials that, that don't end up looking like the, the vinyl siding piece onto buildings to be able to take um, these events. Uh, photovoltaics is another area. This is a, a, a we've done some testing. Uh, these do have to meet a, a testing standard, which is a positive, one of the FM ice ball tests, uh, but often they're very value engineered. So as soon as you go up a couple kinetic energy uh, notches, uh, the glass will fail, um, but they should be able to take about a two inch kind of impact. But once you get above that, um, they will fail quickly. Uh, at least with most solar events, you can just replace a panel in this example. Um, this wasn't because all of a sudden you had only hailstones on these two panels. Once one impact shatters them, it essentially becomes vulnerable to the rest of the hailstones causing the impact mark. So the two big ones you see, that was likely the very first impact that these uh, photovoltaics saw. Uh, HVAC systems, uh, making sure those fins get uh, essentially combed out, uh, that can damage HVAC equipment over time if you have uh, lots of those impact uh, pop marks on those fins. Um, windows, mentioned windows and doors. Uh, this is an example from one of the Dallas-Fort Worth recent hail events, uh, can easily also let water in. And we know water can help uh, jack up the, the cost of damage. So um, just some, some damage examples there. But kind of our mission critical steps is we really got to take a bite out of the hail loss curve. Uh, like Julian said, understanding the characteristics of hail storms, where the biggest hail falls uh, can help in a lot of ways. Understanding how much of it, the, the energetics, the wind driven aspect is a big unknown, uh, how that varies regionally, and also the climate change component. Um, and I've talked about improving building material testing. It has to be representative of the hazard and evolve as science improves. It has to keep up uh, and give you some real world performance. Um, I mentioned the socioeconomic piece, the kind of cost effective solutions, but we also got to reduce fraud out there. Uh, if you don't need a roof replacement, you don't need to do it. Um, we need to take care of the ones that do need replacements. Uh, and what are those nudges to help get people into the, the, the better building products um, frame of mind? What do, what do we need to do to get people to act? Whether it's uh, incentivized programs, grants, just pure awareness. Um, we got to figure those factors out and that's where social science can actually come in and help us. 
Uh, and then building codes. A lot of people are going to ask that question. Can building codes lean in? A few years ago, actually it was several years ago, um, the American Society of Civil Engineers actually incorporated a HAIL, these risk math. It was there for one code cycle. No requirements, no nothing, and it was removed. Uh, Fort Collins, Colorado was one of the very first larger communities that codified a requirement that all new roofs have to have at least a UL impact rated product. Now at IBHS, we'd love if that was based on our work um, in, in that better performance um, evaluation, but this is a step in the right codification um, process. Again, though, that's still, you're dealing with new builds and then roof replacements, but it, it can be done. Um, and really, ultimately, the idea is right materials, right place, right price. That's the way we get to this. Uh, and we got to take care of dealing with the hazards that we face. Uh, it, it's truly the only way we can, we can stop the damage disruption and the, the financial loss that often accompanies severe weather that we all see over and over and over again. Um, so it's an uphill battle. Uh, but the fact, especially that we've seen changes in the asphalt shingle market already, with our work uh, really does give us hope, but we got to get going on the awareness aspects and get, get people to understand they do have a choice in the, in the materials they put on their home and that we can do better. Uh, so I'll stop there and I, and I want to thank Glenn for inviting me to talk and it's, uh, it's great to be a part of another uh, ICLR series. Thanks so much, Ian. It's always great to have you and the, the work that you're doing on Hale is, is fantastic. This is a, it's a sleeper peril, like you say, people just don't pay attention to it as much as they should. But I opened up by saying that our industry has paid over $6.7 billion out in hail claims since 2008, not including this event. So it's costing us a whole lot of money. And sometimes we focus on other things a little too much, I think. Um, we're having a bit of problems, I think, wrangling up the other slide deck. Um, Glenn Smith, I don't know if you're ready to present or to give it another try. Um, maybe, Glenn, you and Mike, can work on getting those slides up. And in the meantime, I'll just hit Ian with a few questions if that's okay with you, Ian. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's tackle them. Okay, so we talked a, a bit about quality of product and, and that sort of thing. What about uh, quality of installation uh, rather than just the product itself? Does that have any impact on the impact resistance of shingles? So from a shingle perspective, uh, not, not particularly. Um, we see it much more on the wind side of, of, of the perils. Uh, we don't really see much in the way of an installation vulnerability on the hail impact side. Um, now, wind is certainly a, a case there, especially as you get away from asphalt shingle products into the metal and tile world. Um, those products can even be damaged by poor installation at the time of install. Um, so it's extremely vital on the wind vulnerability side. From a hail perspective, it, it's primarily more the material itself and how it ages. Those are the two critical factors uh, to being able to try to find good products that will last uh, for a given time. And if you think about the, the damage we deal with hail, uh, I'll give you some return period analysis from John Allen, a, a professor at Central Michigan. I mean, you're talking, you look at the Oklahoma City in the, in the United States, the OKC and the Dallas-Fort Worth markets. You're talking about a two-inch return period that somewhere like on two years. So you're almost at a coin flip that, you know, a 50% chance each year you're gonna see a two inch hail event. Now, at a point level, it, it certainly, um, the, the probabilities go down, but within those metros, you have big hail events, almost, it's just regularly. And you think about it on the wind design side, we're talking 300 year return periods as our design standard. We're not even at 50%, unfortunately, with hail. And uh, as somebody who's, who's now for about eight years been looking at this stuff, um, I've turned from being kind of the joking Ian to being a lot more serious about this problem um, because it's, it's, it's becoming very frustrating to watch this happen repeatedly. And, and maybe this is where codes can lean in, but you gotta have a will and it's gotta start at the local level. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, but uh, Glenn Smith, I wonder if you can try sharing your desktop again. Uh, try to share the desktop rather than just the application, and we'll see if that gets working. Um, Glenn, is that okay? Okay, I'm not sure. Um, another question is, is, is your list of rated shingles comprehensive? Are you missing any products in there? 
So those are the major market share of all class four rated. There are some what we call premium products that are more designed for aesthetics that do meet that. Uh, that is not all encompassing of the asphalt single market as a whole. Um, that's pretty representative of, you know, north of 60, 70% of the market for the class four impact products. Now, we decided in kind of strategically that, that okay, these are the products that are marketed to having some degree of resilience. Uh, it, it's not fair to others that aren't designed or marketed that way uh, to go out and, and list their performance. Um, so we focused on those that are classified as impact rated and wanted to distinguish between those. So this, the list itself, the, the most current one, you're, you're somewhere north of 65, probably 70% total market share of those impact rated products. We haven't tested them all. Um, there are a handful of those premiums that, that we probably um, may not get to, but anything that, that manufacturers bring to us as a, a product change or as they remove products from the market, as soon as that's available in the supply chain, we will we will bring those in, and uh, we're actually doing that right now. There's a lot of hail testing um, back at the the IBHS lab. We, we've returned to kind of critical uh, staff at the place to uh, to be able to execute these tests and keep this work going. Right now, this is a U.S. rating, of course, but some of these products are available in Canada. Are you familiar with how many? I, I, I'm familiar with at least one company's products being. Yeah, there, there, there are a couple of those companies that, that are Canadian companies um, by corporate roots. Uh, I would imagine most um, potentially are. I, I am not familiar with the complete Canadian marketplace, um, but it is something, um, and maybe for a future, uh, future session we could look at. Um, we, do, we do from time to time retrieve market share information, so um, that could be something that we could provide and, and take a look at down the road. Is there... I think I know the answer to this, but is there a clear benefit cost argument with respect to impact resistant shingles? And do you know if this has been done in Canada? Uh, I don't know if it's been done in Canada, but if you look at total performance, you're looking at somewhere probably 15 on average between a non IR and an impact rated product, 15 to 18% improvement in total performance. And now for some manufacturers, that's as high as 34% in total performance. So if you take a look at the big picture, if you whittle down one or two roof replacements over the course of 10 years, if you're talking like four or five in these areas that see constant hail events, in the law of large numbers, you are going to take a big bite out of the dollars that come from hail damage. Um, and that's the question. You're, you're only looking at, um, in most cases, in a good market that has good product availability, maybe 5% five to 8% or so increase in cost. Um, so this is, it's a solution. It's just, I think what we're suffering from is more lack of awareness that, that people have a choice. Um, and, and we're trying to reach out to manufacturers to have their roofing, uh, the contractors that do their roofing work and, and, and put on their products on roofs, do some of the sales jobs for us to help raise that awareness. And especially some of those companies that are at the top of the list, uh, you're seeing a lot of motion from them. They're very proud that they have products that, that happen to fall up at the top and they, um, that they want to tout that they, they make good materials. We all want a quality roof on our house. I mean, having a roof over our heads is one of the basic kind of human needs. Uh, and we want to know that we had something that was, was quality put on our homes. Right. So I think you kind of answered this uh, in this last answer, but um, maybe to re reiterate, what share of hail damage to the roof can be prevented by impact resistant shingles? I know that being at a previous events of yours, that 90, that IR shingles can stand up to 95% of all hailstorms, correct? That's, that's probably about right. The, the thresholds where you jump from kind of the frequency of events, that's that kind of two inch threshold itself. Uh, you're looking at some of the most damaging hail events, about the, the top 10% of all hail storms. So you're looking at somewhere beneath that where you can actually mitigate. Um, now, again, once you get probably in the, the, the two and a half, I hesitate to even say that, the, the three and four inch events, you're designing for the extremes at that point. Um, but those are still rare. Those are still rare cases. And even our Calgary storm is a rare event. Um, 
the, the question is, can we, can we mitigate against the everyday, the run of the mill hailstorms that are the one inch, inch and a half that keep totaling roofs uh, left and right? Um, that's where um, I think we can, we can, in terms of percentages, I mean, you, you've got to believe it, it's better than 50%, if not closer upwards than that, you know, 60, 70. Um, right. The, um, you, uh, uh, you kind of uh, talked a little bit about this in the presentation, but the impact of age on impact res resilience, like how does this change the shingle over time? I know you're not quite there yet, but I also know that IBHS has shingle farms located all over the United States. Do you have any IR products on those shingle farms? And do you know we, anything else about age? We do. And we are in the middle of testing our very first set of five-year specimens. Um, the one concern we, we do have with aging is uh, a lot of the granules on, on asphalt shingles, that gritty, rocky substance, uh, can really easily get dislodged and, and come off, uh, especially even in these high concentration events. And, and the worry is that that exposes the underlying asphalt mat to ultraviolet or sunlight, um, and that, can, that will degrade the asphalt mat underneath. That, that's, a, that's a physics chemistry problem there. Um, so we do worry that if, if those granules come off in mass, you can see a, a degrading of the underlying product. So for the next event, it might be more vulnerable. The question is these new products, the polymer modifieds, they haven't been on the market. Well, the technology has been around for a, a while. They're increasing in market share and we don't quite know enough about how those will age. Does, the, does that particular material, because it's a little more flexible, uh, does it hang on to those granules uh, a little bit better and reduce that impact of UV? Uh, we're going to learn that. So please stay tuned. We're going to have th those results will be coming out over the coming months as we complete that test program. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see what the, the performance relativities are between kind of the new stuff that I actually showed today, uh, a new product, and, and what we see at the five-year mark. And we do. We, we've got aging farms across the United States. We have uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Amelia, Ohio, at the, our lab in South Carolina, we've got one set in uh, South Alabama uh, and Kansas City too. I should very mention cool. uh, our farm got its very first hailstorm, uh, marginally severe event, about one inch, very low concentrations. Uh, we did not see any visible, uh, noticeable damage, and we did have some hail sensing instruments at the time, but. Uh, it took five years uh, before we got a, a case at, at our lab. Um, at least it wasn't a really giant one that would have accelerated our experiment um, by, by a few years. Interesting. Well, we'll be sure to maybe have you on another event when you have some more findings to share. Um, how effective is hardy board siding, do you find? or cement fiber board siding. So I think that's the next step is if you look at trying to get away from the vinyl products that can get very brittle. Um, we haven't tested it per se. Um, we, we Way back when we're doing some of our proof of concept work, um, we did look at it. Um, it's going to give you some degree better protection than, than vinyl. That's, that's very clear. Uh, how much, we don't know yet. That's something we're going to be working on, trying to see if we can apply our test, um, not only just the test protocol, but how we assess damage to wall, um, wall products. And, and you may see ultimately that will find its way into our fortified home program. Um, but that I think is, is the cost effective step uh, is, is to get more toward those concrete fiberboard products that do, um, they also you know, think about some of the other perils offer you good non-combustible siding in a fire scenario, a wildfire type event. So exactly. um, we're always on the lookout for those, those products that actually have multi-peril um, resistance. So um, we'll see how that goes. We'll, 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 we'll know more once we get into that. But I do think they, they offer um, an added protection, just how much we don't know. So that side-by-side -side image that you showed of the shake on one side and the vinyl on the other is, is pretty powerful. Do you have other side-by-side -side images of hail damage to roofs with and without impact resilience? I think you do. Uh, we, we, I'm sure we do out there in, in IBHS land. Uh, we have lots of images, even from our own testing. Um, that one was a great one that, that Julian happened to catch on, on Twitter that, that we got to, to throw up there. And it, it, to be honest, from a, an actual event, that was one of the best I, I've actually seen. Uh, and it happened to be an apartment complex. Um, but, you know, we'll see, you know, one of the common things, you'll see a, a vinyl siding house that has one side that, that's really been severely damaged. And across the street, you have a brick veneer that, that's fine. Uh, and in some cases, these wind-driven hail events may not damage the roof as severe. Um, 
but yeah, there's, there's lots of that out there and, you know, check out some of the stuff that we have at IVHS.org and disastersafety.org. Um, you'll see some of it. Um, I'd also encourage folks to check out our, our YouTube and Vimeo channels. So if you want to see some of the testing we do in some of these imageries um, that we do in the lab, please check those out. Right. And I was, I was present at the world's first indoor hailstorm. So I, I, it's very, very cool work and very important work. That one, um, that one was a really good one. You could see how um, our two inch hail at the time really just pummeled the, the, the roof and the gutter systems. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of siding damage just due to the building shape that we had, but um, it was a great way to do that. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll look to do those demonstrations where we can show side by side performance differences in a controlled environment in our lab. Um, somebody noted that there looked like there was also stucco in that picture and that stucco looked like it was damaged. So I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that's entirely possible. And I do know that can be susceptible to uh, impacts. Um, and that's something, you know, in the U.S., we don't see a whole lot of stucco homes in the hail prone regions. That's a lot of the, the western probably third of the country um, has a lot more stucco wall cover. Um, but it, it wouldn't surprise me. I'm going to even flip back over there to see if I can take a look. But yeah, it, that, that, wouldn't, um, that wouldn't surprise me. Are you um, seeing any instances of insurers offering premium discounts for IR roofing? Uh, so, so there are several companies that, that do offer that uh, in the U.S. Um, there are also state departments of insurance here in the U.S. that, that do, um, there's a couple states that do have uh, discounts built in there. So some, you know, some companies have cho you know, chosen to go that route. Uh, there's other companies that have done endorsements, especially tied to, to some of our Fortify programs to help people get better roofs. Uh, we've seen a lot of success with that in the wind aspect, especially in Alabama and North Carolina. Uh, so there is, there is action being taken. Um, what we have learned from the, the social science aspect is that, that incentives by themselves aren't enough. Um, it's actually surprising, and it may surprise some people, it, it, the finance side doesn't get people into the funnel. Now, it can kick you out of the funnel of getting a, a better material, uh, but it's simply the awareness aspect uh, that gets people to take the step to go investigate. Um, but what we want to happen is to start to remove the roadblocks that people may face where, where a contractor may, you know, the first guy you talk to may tell you, oh, I can't get that product. Well, shop it around. You know, we, we shop around everything these days and look at reviews on the internet. You know, we can do that with our roof. Uh, don't take the first quote you get. And if you want a good product, demand it. Consumers, we have a lot more power than I think we give ourselves credit for. So um, the, the finances can kick people out of the, the funnel, but uh, it's not by itself, it's not enough. Um, we got to get people's neighbors telling their neighbors that they did this. And, uh, my parents put on a fortified roof in, uh, this past year. And you, you, I've never seen my mom talk about a roof as much as she did once she got her fortified roof on the house. So um, it kind of blew me away that uh, there was a sense of pride in the roof. So uh, we, we can demand better. It, it, we have some, some, some buying power. Absolutely. Um, before I move on to another question, I'm uh, just wondering where we stand with Glenn Smith. I saw his slide deck up there for a little while, then it's off again. I think there's an internet connection with, with him, but can we yeah. get an indication of what's going on? Yes. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Glenn. Okay. I have to apologize. Um, I'm here at a hotel with 100 adjusters, and they're all on WebEx in today with some of their training. And this hotel is just not supporting me. Every time I, I can bring it up for about a minute and then it just goes away. Um, so I, I have to apologize for that. And I, I've, I've sent it to you guys, but unfortunately I'm looking at my outbox and it's just grinding so slow it hasn't even gone to you. So um, I'm, I'm stuck. Okay. Um, do you want to make any verbal comments about, um, about uh, uh, Southern Alberta? Yes, that I can. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the uh, the map that we had, and as Julian stated earlier, the storm came from the uh, southwest and went out to the northeast, and we have the uh, a center out in Saddle Ridge area of, of Calgary that the largest stones were, the softball, baseball uh, type hailstones were, and then it it only affected a fairly small area 
Um, as it gets a little bit away from the center mass, then you start getting the smaller hail damage. And you reach out to, uh, on over to where um, the highway, the interstate is, and, and those areas over there uh, really don't have anything. So um, we're dealing with a, a small area-wise, but there's a large policy in force in that area. In other words, there's a lot of homes in that area that have damage. Um, it's not like the entire area of Calgary was hit, it's just that particular portion. But then the hail that it had, and these guys have already touched on that, it was large, very large. Most of it in that center area was at least tennis ball size, and some of it was larger than that. So as they have already been discussing, the damages there are very severe. Um, there was a little wind with this as it's traveling from the uh, from the southeast to the northwest. That gives you all that siding damage that you're seeing, and and really the kind of hail we're talking about. It didn't matter whether it was brand new or not. It still uh, really annihilated what was there. Uh, one of the things I want to say about hail: it's random in size, it's random in shape, it's random in how hard it is, it's random in its fall pattern. It's a, it's a random deal all the way across the board. Uh, in the very same area, you'll have hail that may only be the size of a dime or a quarter, and then there may also be a tennis ball size hail there. However, in this particular storm that concentrated what I'll call ground zero had a lot of the large, large stones. It was more than I usually see. As a matter of fact, I've only really had one other storm, and that was in Denver in 94, that I saw it as concentrated as I see it here on this particular storm. Um, the direction with the wind that it has, that's what actually what affects those, um, the windows that they were talking about and the siding and the elevations. Um, you're gonna see heavy damage on one to two sides of the, of the dwellings. Um, the other two sides probably won't have anything on the elevation at all. Um, then um, the resistance of the uh, the structures that Ian's talking about, the, the roofing, uh, that makes a, and he's already mentioned this and talked about it, but it makes a major difference in what the damage is. Uh, the new shingles or the hail-resistant shingles, obviously, aren't going to have near as much damage, but that is only in the outer lying areas. In this ground zero area, everything's damaged it it starts the the effect of the better shingles starts taking effect the further away from ground zero you go um, when you get the newer more hail resistant shingles you will start beginning you will start having houses that have very little or no damage on a roof as you go away from ground zero and then those that have the older roofs or the roofs that are not near as uh, structurally sound in the material that will have that will be damaged. So those are the kind of things that we start dealing with in what we're doing out there as we're working the storm. So those are just some quick things I wanted to say. You know, the newer the roofs, the less damage we see. The older the roofs, the more damage we see, with the exception of the ground zero portion, and that pretty well everything is hit there. Um, and that. That's really what, what I've got. I'm really open for any questions or anything that anybody might have. Yeah, so Glenn, one of the things I, I, I find interesting is that it seems like there's a large number of vehicular write-offs uh, with this storm. It's not something you hear a lot about, vehicles being totally written off by hail, including new vehicles. Do, do you have any comment on, on that? Well, exactly, and, and you're exactly right on this particular storm here it's because of the number of vehicles that are in that area there uh, and the top hail that we have here, and uh, it's, it's major. Uh, the, you saw the photographs that I believe Julian had earlier today with the uh, uh, broken out windows and the uh, fenders and all those things of the top construction that the vehicles are these days. Uh, a hail storm like this is just a, a significant, significant factor. And, and there's really no way to protect against that without putting it under cover. Uh, as far as the material itself, they're not designed to withstand this type of a damage. Uh, and so that's, that's what's happening. Uh, we just kind of got caught up in that with this particular storm. 
Excellent. Um, somebody asked uh, if you can possibly repeat where you found the big hail damage was. The big hail was what, uh, what, what community specifically? Let me come up here and pull that map up. Um, it is north of 16th Avenue and it is uh, see, 16th Avenue is Highway 1 there and then it is to the towards over towards uh, if you're going out towards Chestmere it's on the north side of 16th Avenue and that's okay. going to be on the east see southwest side to the east that's the east side of uh highway two is that what that is up through there i believe it is so it's on the east side of highway two uh up around country hills boulevard on the south side of country hills boulevard uh, i believe it's called the saddle ridge edition uh that's the main edition um the heavy area starts just north of mcknight boulevard Okay. Um, are you aware of any aircraft uh, damage at the airport? I am not. I was I was interested in that question that you asked a while ago. Um, from talking to the people that I have working out there, the airport area I don't believe had much damage at all. Uh, this is really close to it, obviously, um, but I, I just have not heard. I. I, I to, to voice it, uh, it'd just be a guess, so I don't know. Somebody's asked about the average uh, claim size. I don't know if you have a uh, comment on that, Glenn. I know from the Airdrie event in 2014, the average personal property claim was just over $12,000. The average commercial claim was just under $50,000. The average auto claim was just under $6,000. Do you have any any feel at all for that? I don't have any exact numbers for you. I can tell you this. I expect it to be higher than the average $12,000 claim you were talking about just because of the area that's hit. Um, we're looking at homes that are a little higher value in that particular area right there. So, um, And also, everything in that area, they're going to be replacing the roofs on. So I expect that that, uh, that claim number is going to be a little higher than, than what the one you're talking about. Right. Yeah, um, it's uh Okay. So at this stage, you know, we'll we'll open open it up to questions for everybody. Um I just wanted to note to everybody that uh the presentations will be on our website on probably Monday. The recording of this session will be on our YouTube channel probably also on on Monday. Uh and yeah, so those those three will be available. A lot of people are asking questions about that. Um, I wanted to maybe put try to put somebody on the spot right now. Um, if Murray Pound is listening, I wonder if you'd be willing to come off a of mute and just throw your two cents worth in. Murray was a home builder in southern Alberta for many years and uh, has a lot to say about impact resili resistant products and, and things like that. So Murray, if you're on, I wonder if, you, if I could put you on the spot. Would you be willing to comment on a, on a few things? Not sure if Murray's still on or not. I'll leave it at that anyway. Uh, Murray, if you're listening and if you wanted to uh, say a few words, uh, it's up to you. You can just barge in whenever you want. Um, do you have a, an idea, Glenn, of the area affected? Now, we, you talked about specific neighborhoods, but do you have a, a, an idea of kind of the area as a whole that was impacted? I heard that a total of nine communities were hit with significant hail uh, it's uh, north of highway one and the east of, of uh, highway two the main interstate going north that entire area out there until you get out to uh, 791 um is, is, is has damage uh, there is some smaller hail damage in the southwest part of town uh, starting around 17th avenue and um just south of Highway 1 there, down between Highway 1 and 17th Avenue, along Center Street. Uh, from that area 
up to Saddle Ridge area. There was some lighter hail. And that's really what you kind of, you know, as I look at the overview here, and I'm, I apologize again that I don't have it for you, but you, you, as a storm starts growing and starts developing, the hail will start smaller. And then it'll grow and get bigger and, and bigger until it gets to its peak, which is, is the apex of the storm. And then it'll start waning again. And it'll start dropping back off and be a, a smaller and smaller until it uh, fades away. So you'll have a fairly large area that has some hail that has fallen, but it won't all be damaging hail. That grows as the storm intensifies. And so based on the structures themselves and the quality of the roofing itself and the decking and fence and, and stuff like that, um, the hail will then start doing damage. Um, it won't damage everything. You will have homes in those areas that one, one house may have damage. It may have had an older roof that might have been facing directly to the storm, and the very next house has no damage at all. They replaced their roof three years ago, and the hail wasn't big enough there to hurt it. So you'll have a mixture as the storm's growing and as the storm's waning of houses that have damage and houses that don't have damage. Many times as the storm reaches its apex, you'll have that ground zero area that even though it was heavier hail, it was a hail that didn't damage some of the newer roofing, as Ian was talking about a while ago. I don't see that with what we're seeing in this particular storm. If it's in what I see as the ground zero area, we're buying the roofs there, um, and the cars are being bought there. It, this hailstorm was significant enough and the hail was large enough and heavy enough that in that ground zero area, everybody had damage, no matter what. But then as it starts fading away, and that works both, that works in all four directions. You know, you'll, you'll have an area of town there and it may not be very far from the, the, the hard hit area and it's actually not. I mean, within, uh, couple of miles, uh, three miles, there's not any hail damage at all because the hail didn't fall there at all. It's it's on a path, and it started in the southwest center part of town and went out to the uh, northeast. So how about a raft of questions uh, about your operation, Glenn? Um, how, how big is your crew there right now? Are you going to be able to see everybody? How long is it going to take to do repairs, and, and how has COVID impacted all of this? Well, that's a very um, fluctuating number on, on all of that. Uh, as far as the number of people we have out there right now, currently I have approximately 300 people working on this storm, and that's actually growing just a little bit. And that's just, that's just us. Uh, you know, there are several other companies that are also involved, obviously. Um, but between all of the people that I have, I, I have over 300, and again, that's growing. So uh, uh, as far as how long is it going to take to, to make those repairs, well, here's one of the problems that comes with a major storm like this. The contractors are all very, very busy. Uh, you can imagine there's just not enough contractors for everybody. These repairs, these roofing repairs, are going to go well into next year. Um, uh, and, and weather is going to be the big factor here. Uh, what I envision happening on this particular storm, and the reason I look at that like this is because the, the storm in 2010, I was actually in Calgary working that storm as well. Um, uh, what I envision here is there's still going to be claims to be worked and looked at when the snow falls in the end of, no, of October. And once it does, then there's, we cannot inspect housetops anymore. So we'll be shut down all winter as far as inspections go. You can't see what the damage is. Um, that's a, a, a kind of a cushion area for contractors in some pieces, but in other pieces it's not because they can't put roofs on when it's all covered in snow. So, uh, you know, there, there are some hurdles to clear there. Uh, one of the interesting things that I noted in Julian's presentation a while ago was his time frame. Um, 
this storm here is 2020. And that last big one, the $400 million one was 2010, 10 years ago. And the one before that was 10 years before that, you know, it's, and, and I've noticed that in my career and it doesn't matter whether it's hail or it's hurricanes, but the big storms appear to come in 10 year cycles. Um, and well, I, I noted that when I saw that. So, uh, but contractors are going to be very busy. They're not going to get everything done before, uh, the winter hits. Uh, there's going to be work to be done still, and probably a lot of it after um, winter, after March, April of next year. Um, so we're looking at right now about 35,000 claims have filed. Uh, there was uh, over 51,000 filed for Airdrie in 2014. Are you expecting a, a big bump in the number of claims filed over the next little while? I don't know that there'll be a big bump in the number of claims, but the dollar values will be higher. Right. You mentioned that um, this is probably on the upper end of some of the storms that you've seen. Uh, can you compare these to any of these, any of those you've seen in, in the U.S., Dallas, Fort Worth, Denver? Are they comparable? Is it comparable? I would say, I would say the '96 storm in Dallas, Fort Worth was comparable. Uh, Prior to that, it would have been the 84 storm that I worked in Denver. Uh, we have big hail storms, obviously, in the States, uh, but this is a big storm. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. This is a really, really big storm. And, uh, and, I, and I say that in terms of size of hail and dollar value and damage. Uh, and, and, and the mention was made a while ago about because of the the type housing and all of that that's in the area, and that's absolutely true. Uh, it's uh, you know you you you're in the range of uh, on the dollar value, you're on the upper range of everything there, so that's why you're going to have that. Now, I believe uh, Murray Pound has been able to call in, uh, and Murray, if you want to say a few words, Murray was a home builder for many years in Carstairs, Alberta and was very very big on resilience, and he took it upon himself to use impact resilient resistant products on roofs and siding uh and things of that nature uh murray do you have a few comments you want to make about uh, about what we're talking about today yeah murray you're not coming through it's a uh, garbled sounds like a charlie brown cartoon okay Murray, you're, you're not coming through. It's all garbled. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's almost time that we wrap up here. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions uh, to talk about or to ask. Um, I want to thank the speakers very much. And uh, I wanted to point out a couple of things. First of all, uh, we talked about ICLR's Hail Climatology of Canada and update. That document is available on our website for free. It's quite easy to find under the library section. And uh, secondly, I wanted to point out our booklet, uh, Protect Your Home from Hail. Uh, this is a very comprehensive booklet um, that uh, helps insurers and others give advice to people about how they can protect their properties against uh, hail, or the products that they can use, the considerations that they can take. Uh, the, the booklet's on our website in English and in French, and you'll find that under the homeowner section of our website. Uh, so at this point, uh, I think we'll wrap it up. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank uh, Dr. Julian Brimlow. Brimlow. I want to thank uh, Glenn Smith, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Ian Giamenko. appreciate your insights very much, and, and, um, and just, just thanks very much.